Hey everybody, in this video we're going to state and prove the p-test for improper integrals. First consider the function 1 over x to the p, where p is a positive number. We are interested in analyzing the area under this graph from 1 to infinity. So here's the theorem, and we'll call it the p-test for integrals. If p is greater than 1, then the improper integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p converges. And if p is less than or equal to 1, then this integral diverges. In the proof, it's going to work out that we can say more than this. In fact, we can assert that this integral will converge to the value 1 over p minus 1. And the divergence is actually uh, quite specific. It actually diverges to infinity. Let's get acquainted with these functions first. The simplest case, perhaps, is p equals 1. So this is the reciprocal function, uh, whose graph we know and love. So here's the graph of the reciprocal function. And let's take a look at 1 over x squared. This is the case p equals 2. And then we can look at 1 over x to the fifth. This is the case p equals 5. So what's happening here is that as p goes to infinity on the region we care about to the right of 1, we notice that the graph is getting squished towards the x-axis. More on this in a moment. But let's go in the other direction. Let's take p equals, say, a half. So this is 1 over the square root function, actually, 1 over square root of x. Um, here would be the case p equals 1 fifth, 1 over x to the 1 fifth power. So we'll just observe that as p approaches 0, these graphs seem to be pushing upwards uh, to the right of the argument 1. And by the way, the opposite effect is occurring on the other side. They're actually being dragged down towards the x-axis on the left side. And in fact, we can imagine what the limiting case really is. Because when x is greater than 0, x to the 0 is just 1 always. Which means the function 1 over x to the 0 is actually the constant function 1 to the right of the origin. So there is an explicit function which serves as the limiting value as p approaches 0 from the right. And let's go look at the other end of the spectrum. What happens as we let p grow without bound? We let p go off to infinity. Well, in that case, we saw that the graph to the right of x equals 1 seems to be pushing towards the x-axis. The opposite effect is occurring to the left of 1 and to the right of 0. And so the limiting case here is a little funky. Um, it's, it's not the graph of a function on the interval from 0 to infinity. It's the constant function 0 to the right of 1. It's actually uh, the limiting case with just 1 raised to any power is always 1. So every graph is going to pass through the point 1, 1. And then the left-hand side isn't even really a function in the limiting case as you let p approach infinity. So, for example, here's the case y equals 1 over x to the 30, which is very close to this L shape. Now, um, please be aware that this graph actually passes the vertical line test everywhere. It's just that it goes very steep quickly to the left of 1. You'd have to go very far up to find the graph for x approaching 0. But to the right, x approaches 0 quite quickly, and you can see that you almost have the constant function 0 on the right side. So let's go back to our p-test, and we're interested in proving this. And what we'll do is we'll start with the boundary case, p equals 1, this dividing line between p greater than 1 and p less than or equal to 1. We can evaluate the improper integral directly pretty quickly. So we set this up, as usual, with a simple improper integral with one bad endpoint. The antiderivative is ln of x. We will evaluate at k and 1 and subtract, but the limiting value here of ln of k is infinity. This diverges to infinity. And so that takes care of the case p equals 1. So now let's find the antiderivative in this case where p is not equal to 1. So 1 over x to the p is x to the negative p. So we can run the power rule in reverse. And here's the moment to appreciate why we need p not to equal 1. Because if p were actually equal to 1, we'd have a problem here because we'd have a, a 0 in the denominator. So that's no good. And that's where this hypothesis really kicks in. Um, negative p plus 1 is the opposite of p minus 1. And if we rewrite our exponent this way, then we can actually rewrite the expression as 1 over negative p plus 1 times 1 over x to the p minus 1. So there's our antiderivative. We want to evaluate this definite integral. So we'll take our antiderivative, plug in k and 1, and subtract. 
And when we do that, we get this expression here. And for convenience, we're going to wind up switching both signs here. So we'll get this expression, which is the same. It's just that we've changed both signs. So now here's an expression for our definite integral. What comes next? We need to evaluate the limit. Let's concentrate on the case where p is between 0 and 1 first. We're going to isolate out this term here. We need to look at the limit as k goes to infinity, so let's just do some prep work here. If p is between 0 and 1, then 1 minus p is a positive quantity. And so, when you look at the limit of 1 over k raised to the p minus 1, that's the same as the limit as k goes to infinity of k raised to the 1 minus p, but since 1 minus p is positive, we're looking at a positive power of k as k goes to infinity, that means this limit diverges to infinity. So here's the expression for our definite integral in the interval from 1 to k. This quantity is negative because p is between 0 and 1, and this quantity will diverge to negative infinity. We're looking at 1 minus 1 over k to the p minus 1. And we just figured out that 1 over k to the p minus 1 diverges to infinity. So the signs cancel, and the limit actually diverges to infinity. And so this is one of our cases. The improper integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p diverges to infinity if p is between 0 and 1. And by the way, we've included the case p equals 1, which we did just a moment ago. So now we have the case p greater than 1. So if p is greater than 1, then p minus 1 is greater than 0. And so the limit of 1 over k to the p minus 1, since p minus 1 is positive, the denominator goes to infinity, which means this limit goes to 0. And now we look at our expression for the definite integral. This limiting value will be 1, and we get as a limit 1 over p minus 1. In passing, we'll notice that the result is positive, which we would expect, given the graph, we would expect that area under the curve to be positive, and it is. And this is our other case. When p is greater than 1, then the improper integral from 1 to infinity is 1 over p minus 1. And more generally, we notice that this converges. And in fact, we could have started the integration not just at 1, but any positive quantity off to infinity, and we would have got a convergent quantity. The value would be different, but any of those integrals also converge. So there's our p-test for integrals. p is greater than 1, then the improper integral from 1 to infinity is going to wind up being finite. In fact, it's given by 1 over p minus 1. If p is between 0 and 1, 1 inclusive, then the integral diverges. Now we're going to end with a few observations here. Let's just go back to the case p equals 1, the reciprocal function. That was an easy calculation. We were able to show that diverges to infinity. So this area is infinite. And the thing to notice is that if p is between 0 and 1, then the graph actually lies above this region to the right of x equals 1. So we were looking for this area, and we would expect that area to be infinite as well, since it encloses an area that's already known to be infinite. But if that area is infinite, then what we're saying really is that this improper integral should diverge to infinity as well. So what we're saying is the, the very case of p equals 1 diverging to infinity should have told us already that it was going to diverge to infinity for all p less than or equal to 1. And now when p is greater than 1, we know our graph actually dips below the reciprocal case. Now in this case, this is a finite area. It's actually equal to 1 over p minus 1, some finite quantity. No shock here because this new area is enclosed within something that's infinite, so that doesn't mean that it has to be infinite as well. In fact, it's finite. But one of the things to notice is that if we were to tune p, so we let p approach 1 from the right, we would, we would push this graph upwards towards the reciprocal function, so it should enclose more and more area. And indeed, if you look at the limiting value of 1 over p minus 1 as p approaches 1 from the right, you actually see that limit diverges to infinity, which makes perfect sense. Whenever p is greater than 1, you're going to get a finite area. But if you let p sneak up to 1, that area in the limit is going to diverge to infinity, which is what you get when you look at p equals 1. So um, you should see how all these results fit together quite nicely.